Social norms change, but church teaching doesn't. How do Catholics prepare themselves to talk about confusing or unpopular church teachings? Is there a way to do that effectively and still have friends? Join us today as we look at those questions and more with Father Carter Griffin, author of the book, Cross-Examined, Catholic Responses to the World's Questions. I'm Father Dave Pavanka, and I'm president of Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. I'm your host, Father Dave Pavankin. I'm president of Franciscan University of Steubenville. Today we're discussing how to talk about church teachings. I'm joined by our panelist, Dr. Regis Martin, professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, the Father Michael Scanlon, professor of biblical theology in the New Evangelization here at Franciscan. And we're pleased to welcome our special guest, Father Carter Griffin. Father Carter is a priest of the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. He's a former naval officer and the rector of the St. John Paul II Seminary in Washington, D.C. He is also the author of Why Celibacy? Reclaiming the Fatherhood of the Priest and the book we'll be discussing today, Cross-Examined, Catholic Responses to the World's Questions. Father Carter, thank you for joining us so much. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Maybe why, why this book? Why now? What was moving in your heart that says, okay, we need to get this out? Well, I think it really began with um, the, the beginning of our seminary, really. We started the seminary 11 years ago, St. John Paul II Seminary, and we had all of our dreams of things we wanted to do with the seminarians, and one of those was to equip these guys as best as we could for, um, for the world that they're going to find as priests, you know? And so we started to go through, very simple at first, in fact, I didn't want to write the book. I wanted to buy the book, uh, but, I, but I couldn't find it, so I wanted to have something very uh, very concise. I mean, these are younger guys. Guys in college typically okay. are at the seminary here or just after college. Um, something that would be uh, sort of a takeaway sheet for them, um, but that didn't just say what the Catholic position was, but also what some of the primary objections to the Catholic position uh, were, as well as maybe some possible responses to those objections. Sort of the idea of uh, loosely based upon the old scholastic method, you know, Thomas Aquinas and so forth, sort of objections, you know, Catholic, and then sort of the responses to I like the what objections. you said that apparently when you first started it, you wanted to, one piece of paper, front and back. That's it. Right. Yeah. And that's yeah. fantastic. That's just a yeah. fantastic yeah. model. It was a great discipline for me, too. It's like, okay, I got to get this into two sides of yeah. one sheet, you know. Uh, so that was the beginning, and we just started to go through it, then it built over the years. and. Um, and then COVID hit, and I had a little bit of time on my hands. I said, well, I might as well put these in. A lot of people had said this would be really helpful to have, you know, yes. uh, as right. a takeaway. And so that was kind of the beginnings of the... Of the you know, the, the standard line, I think, on Q&A approaches to the faith is that here's this sledgehammer I've got, and I'm just going to pulverize uh, uh, the enemy, which is really antithetical to uh, the method that you employ, which I think you draw from the inspiration of St. Thomas himself, who, who, who exercised this wonderful hospitality, this tentative sympathy he would extend even to the most fierce of, of, of critics of, of the Catholic thing. He would let them speak their mind, and that's what you do. Lay it out, give me your best shot, and, and, and you're open to that, and then you blast them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just share the, yeah, the, what the format is. Sure. So, yeah. Well, it's 25 different um, topics, uh, and uh, each one starts out with a kind of a proposal, you know, about, and it would be in the Catholic tradition. So, to be, you know, is it, uh, is it wrong to, um, you know, to, wh why, why are women not ordained to the priesthood? Okay. Or something like that. And then you start with all the objections to the Catholic position, and then I go through the Catholic, and then I respond to them. So it goes through, um, as I said, sort of a very brief period, you know, sort of a brief number of, of words for each one. Um, and the, the way that we would use it in the seminary is actually in a kind of a dialogical format. So we'd actually have one of the seminarians, you know, give the, give the objection as it's written or as I had written on the sheet. Uh, and then I would open it up to see if anyone else can either 
expand on that, strengthen that, um, or think of another approach to that. Um, and then you go through all the different objections. And you know, Dr. Martin, you mentioned that this is antithetical to the book, but it's really antithetical to the faith to right. treat yep. those who disagree with us with scorn or yeah. you know, resent. Right, right. There's a sense in which yeah. um, these are not, I mean, one of the key things I wanted to get across is the fact that people who disagree with us are not necessarily either evil or dumb, you yeah. know? Right. No, I thought you said that crucial. in the beginning. Yeah. You say that these are well-reasoned, and that is so, yeah. I, I, when I was studying law, that's one of the things I came to, is that mm -hmm. the other argument is not stupid. Yeah. But the, and right. I thought that was right. such a good point. You know, this approach is so disarming, and at the same time, it, it, it's um, instilling confidence in the Catholic. Uh, I remember converting, you know, and discovering an entirely different style of thinking and speaking. As evangelical Protestants, what we were thinking is exactly where we started and finished. Whereas for Catholics, my sense was <laughs> there's a dialectic. You can always tell what a Catholic thinks because it's the opposite of what he begins with. <laughs> you know, it's balance, it's proportion, but it's fairness and it's charity, and it's at least 750 years old because you go back to the Summa, and that that way of you know, stating the question, but then identifying the arguments against your position, and stating them precisely, stating them accurately, but also stating them as forcefully as possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, wow. I mean, your opponent at that point not only feels disarmed, but respected. Mm -hmm. right. And yeah. especially right. when Aquinas yeah. could come up with arguments that his opponents hadn't even thought of, right. you know. And says and so, them better than they ever did. That's yeah. right. Right, right. Yeah. And then at the same time, identify the truth in each one of these okay. objections, yeah. like you do with purgatory and hell, suffering, salvation, communion, divorce, transgender animal rights, and it's like the whole panoply. It's like, you know, I wish I had three thumbs. You know, the, the norm, <laughs> the, the rule of thumb, I think, is you've got to get inside the mind of uh, your adversary, understand his position even better than he does. Yeah. I mean, Chesterton says that the, the, uh, the art of, of a good controversialist is that he has perfected the art of listening. Mm. He's attentive. He's open. He wants to see the best uh, in, this, in this guy's uh, perspective. I, I must admit that the first time I went through it, I... I spent more times with your objections because right. I know what the church right. teaches. I just like, right. oh, I never thought about that. Oh, that's a good idea. It just it helped yeah. me understand better. I just thought it was masterful. How so thoughtful that, yeah. the objections are. And so, you know, when they're reading this and they're thinking, wait a second, that's exactly what my sister says. Mm -hmm. Only right. she didn't think of that. You right. know? Yeah. I remember. That, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, that was one of the, actually, the criteria of thinking of which topics to have and which topics not to have is, which ones somebody's sister would ask him. You know, right, around, right, I was thinking right, the Thanksgiving right. table kind of conversations, right. you know, that's yeah, exactly, exactly sort of, it's like, would this come up? Yeah. The answer's probably not, so we'll stay out, but this one, well, could come up, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know that that ever occurred to St. Thomas. Now, what, <laughs> what, what are my cousins thinking about this? Right. You know, the, the hypostatic union. In, in a way, it is a great pity that in the seven and a half centuries since the, the passing of St. Thomas, the attention span has really been truncated, I mean, drastically diminished. People don't have patience to wade through the, the Summa Contra Gentiles. Right. They, they want this. I mean, that's not to deprecate what you've done, but it is, I think, lamentable that people just don't want to read. Right, and hopefully this would spark somebody's interest as they get to know. That's what I, I mentioned something in the introduction about sort of seeing the peaks of the mountains, which is a beautiful right. view, and you need to have that. Yeah. You also need to kind of climb the mountain, you know? And <laughs> right. so it, it's, uh, it's sort of a first step. It's sure. clearly apologetics is never comprehensive. It's neither theologically, right. it's not even catechetically comprehensive, you yeah. know, on, on a certain topic. Was, but it, it, yeah. No, well, I appreciate the bibliography you put in each section. Mm. If, if you want to do more, if you want to yeah. read more, yeah. if you'd like to go deeper into this, yeah. this is an avenue that you could do it. Yeah. Well, one of the things you talk about is that the, the, there is a reasonability to the faith, yeah. that, that these arguments, so maybe just speak about that, that it's, sure. this is not merely a, a faith question, but it's, it's actually the intellect and engaging the intellect. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the way I see it is uh, it's a sign of God's respect for how he made us, you know, the, uh, as made in the image and likeness of God is in part because we're rational beings. And so the faith that Catholics are asked to uh, embrace is a faith that will never contradict that. It will, it will never contradict how we're made um, in His image and likeness as rational beings, which means that a lot of the teachings, such as the Ten Commandments, are actually teachings that Aquinas himself says that if you had enough time and enough ability and enough you know, right. space, you, you would come to these conclusions yourself. Yeah. Many of those, uh, but many teachings are not. You know, the hypostatic union or the trinity of persons. Right. And so these are teachings that we receive directly from Revelation 
but even those never do violence to our faith. You know? yeah. And so like that sense that our, our reason is something that can and should be, um, that can should be, to, be used to, to the defense of those teachings and to show that they're not irrational. You know, the, the foundation to this book, like any good foundation, is invisible. You know, yeah. it's underground. Uh, and in this case, I think what, you, what you're stating explicitly in our conversation is what is invisible. That is, there are some things that we can know by reason alone with regard to abortion, with regard to in vitro fertilization, capital punishment, gender dysphoria, and that sort of thing. But there are other things that can only be known by divine revelation. Mm -hmm through the gift of faith. And so when we're looking at Marian devotion, you know, purgatory, praying to the saints, these are sacred mysteries. These are supernatural. And so there's no rational demonstration for the mysteries of faith, or they wouldn't be mysteries, but there is an argument that can be made on the basis of revelation to faith. But Aquinas also points out in the Summa Contra Gentilis that you can't appeal to revelation, you know, when you're dealing with non-believers. Mm -hmm. And so, it's so fitting for you to pivot then when it comes to the reasonableness of the church's teaching, especially with regard to the natural moral law. Because I would say that's been effaced, yeah. eviscerated more yeah. than the supernatural mysteries have, right. at least in the last two right. generations. Right. There, there are two sources of, of respect, I think, that the Catholic is meant to cultivate, and, and both are on copious uh, display in your book. One, you respect the other. You're, you're sensitive to the humanity of, of this person, his integrity, his goodwill. He's, you don't dismiss him as, as stupid uh, or malicious. Yeah. But also respect for the truth, because that, that's what defines us. This unifying theme of reason, ratio, logos. We, we were made for the truth. And nous, as Aristotle reminds us, is the highest human faculty that makes us most like God. We can think, we can know. I, I always cherish uh, Gilson's observation about uh, the Gothic cathedral. What made it possible was the happy combination of geometry and piety. Mm -hmm. yeah. We don't divorce one from, from the other. The church doesn't say, look, check your intelligence before you come into the chapel to pray. Well, and maybe just add a third to that, which is, so it's the truth and respect for the truth and respect for the other, but also this recognition that we're not left off sort of on our own, you know, yeah. that, that we've been given the beautiful gift of the church to help uh, form our minds, to help form us. I mean, my experience was very similar to yours, Dr. Han. When I came into the church, it was, um, I sort of found my pride sort of slowly being, being, you know, being chipped away as I realized, well, I was wrong about this issue. Maybe I was wrong <laughs> about this issue. And the church was right again. The church was right again. And at some point, we're able to say, well, maybe I should assume that the church is right, you know, and, and, <laughs> maybe, and, and maybe I need to be formed by the lot of credit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so there's also that kind of great assurance he did not leave us orphans, you know, and, right, and, and right. being able to draw from that and hopefully present it in a way that's accessible. Can we just maybe just spend another minute or two on, on the respect, and, and everybody's mentioned that, the respect that you pro you give to the other, to the argument. And we live in a world that you can't disagree with anybody. You have to demonize them. And we're seeing that even yeah. with people that are, are on the way to conversion. I mean, Paul never would, would be Paul today because people wouldn't let him get away from his past. But you do that really beautifully. And maybe just speak to that, that, that taking serious the person and the respect and the dignity of that individual. Well, you know, kind of the, 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 the primary text for apologetics is 1 Peter 3.15, you know, where, where where St. Peter talks about giving, that we have to give a reason for our hope, you know, that people expect of us. But then he continues, the part that is sometimes left out, but do it with gentleness and reverence. Right? And in that sense that we, that we have, we have, we, we, we we do have a privileged access to the truth as Catholics, right? And we just have to acknowledge that. And that's no hubris and that's not braggadocio. That's just the reality of the thing. But the way that we bring it to others can be done with great respect and reverence for the other person. Because, you know, the fact is that everybody, what did Philo say? Everyone, be gentle with everyone. For Everyone is going through a great battle, you know, on their own. And so we don't know what people are dealing with. We don't know what their past is. We don't know what, what maybe lies they bought into or that they've been sold. And so recognizing that and as we tread on that sacred ground, we want to present the truth, we want to be strong and evangelical and apostolic, but we want to do so in a way that's respectful of the other right, person. Right. And yeah. I think that's always going to be more effective. Yeah, you know? It really has the additional benefit of reminding us that there are good reasons for disagreeing with the church. Yeah. There are better reasons to submit, to agree, to believe, and all of that. But I mean, it really does give you pause when you're like, okay, there are several good objections yeah, here. It's like, that makes sense. I, I thought of these two, but not those <laughs> yeah. three, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. These people are reasonable, even yeah. if they're wrong, you right. know? Yeah, every now and again, I'd be right into the thing. I'd be like, 
I gotta address this one now. <laughs> <laughs> Tempted to leave it out, but I, you know, you try not to, and you try to do the best you can, and and you realize at the end of the day that there is, in fact, greater minds than mine have have dealt with this before, you know, and I think yeah. that can be a source of confidence for Catholics too in their own apologetical discussion. Yeah, it is sort of astonishing that we've lost sight of that. I mean, yeah. Peter exhorted us uh, in that direction a long time ago, but oftentimes the apologetical style tends to be combative, even brutal. I mean, one of my heroes is Hilaire Belloc. Mm. Uh, and one day he came into church and he was late and the usher said, oh, why don't you sit over here, sir? And Belloc said, go to hell. <laughs> and the guy said, oh, I can see you're a Catholic. <laughs> I mean, that, that's customary. That's how Catholics deal going with, back to, with irritation. Going back to St. Paul and St. Peter, I mean, I, I, I love St. Paul. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he's stellar. He is my mentor and all of that. But I kind of sometimes wish he would mm. do this, you know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because yeah. it's otherwise it's just in your face. It's the argument. Well, you need an Aquinas to translate at St. Paul, I'm sure. But and of course, yeah. today, as you said, it's a very shrill age, you know. And so, oh, yeah. in, in, in an age like this, it's a little bit harder to be the Belloc, you know. So <laughs> maybe that that gentleness has a special role today that previous yeah. ages didn't have. Yeah. Now, and real quickly, you also were doing this for seminarians. Yes. Your thought was just, did you see something lacking, or it's just where well, you I happen think a, to be? A lot come in without really a recognition of, of, of some of the challenges to the faith and objections to the faith, and so a lot of it was giving them a sense that you're going into, uh, you're wading into deep waters, you know, and we need to prepare you as best as we can, okay. um, step by step, and so that's really the reasons why the seminary is Very cool. Yeah. And we're just uh, beginning to get into our topic, so stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. We'll be back. Be truthful. It is false charity to love falsehood. As St. Thomas Aquinas says, the greatest charity one can do to another is to lead him to the truth. Catholic philosopher, Dr. Peter Kraft. Walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. You'll explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage in the Holy Land, Poland, France, Austria, Italy, and more destinations. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We're discussing how to talk about church teachings. Again, Father, the book is so helpful, but what are some of the ways that you've seen this book used or, or other ways that you might suggest that people would benefit from it? You know, one of the, I, I've been receiving emails from people who have, who have had the book and talked talk about a couple of the ways that they've used it. One of them has been in RCIA classes. And I think it could be very helpful. I think it would have been helpful for me. I came through RCIA myself. And um, it could be used as, as a way of, I don't know if it necessarily needs to be done sort of cover to cover, mm -hmm. but there may be particular topics that come up in the course of a conversation, and it can be used as sort of a reference text in that regard. I think ideally it would be used in the way that um, I've been able to use it at the seminary, which is in a group setting where you actually take a topic, you know, for an hour in a certain evening, um, maybe in a young adult group mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever it might be, uh, just a, a book discussion group at a parish, and you actually go through them slowly and, you know, I learned one of the one of the advantages that I had, and I had ten years of doing this with the seminarians, and they would come up with ideas, yeah. or other objections that they had heard, or that they themselves had at one time, um, or maybe a different way to respond to this objection, or something like that. So that can be really helpful in a group setting. So you take one objection at a time, and you, you know, and it can be interesting in a group of Catholics, and you know, so there you are talking about, you know, why you know, why we should not go to a priest for confession, you know, and so you start going through all the reasons why, you know, this is a ridiculous teaching of the church, you know, and other people are sort of, you know, wondering how we're going to respond to this one, you know, and so you kind of go through that and, and take, take a little bit of time with each one. Say like, well, let's make sure we understand this objection. Okay. And then you kind of go through the Catholic position and then you can kind of go through each of those responses. Um, one thing we do at the seminarians is at the end of that discussion, We'll then do a little bit of maybe a five or ten minute sort of role play. We'll take two seminarians, one who's kind of the Catholic and one, one who's the non-Catholic, um, and then it's sort of have them have this discussion, and you know others can pitch in. When we first moved here way back in 1990, I was four years a Catholic at that point, and so I encountered a number of grad students who were interested in getting, you know, quick answers to the questions and the objections that 
evangelical Protestants and others would raise, you know. It reminded me of like when I was in junior high and Mad Magazine had this guy <laughs> named Al Jaffe, you know, <laughs> snappy answers to stupid questions. Right. That's what it seemed like they wanted. And right. so I, I said, let's, let's just turn this around. And so on Sunday nights for almost two years, we met for three hours with a team of 12. And I would divide them up, two people taking the Protestant position, the pagan position, whatever, and then two, and then the next week they would switch sides. Mm -hmm. And we would have about 50 or 60 people listening. But I mean, these guys included, you know, Tim Gray and Curtis Martin and Ted Sri and Father Pablo Gadenz and, wow. and, and Kimberly as well, and James Sanchez and all these others. And when, they, when you allow yourself to feel the force of the opponent's position, and you have to represent it in a way that is compelling. Yeah. You know, it's jarring at first, but then it also gives you a critical sympathy so that you want to crawl into the depth of the answer the church gives, looking in scripture, the church fathers, St. Thomas and everywhere else. And it was, it was transformative. It really was for them, but also I was the MC, but I'd also kind of have to mop up and tie a mm -hmm. loose ends together <laughs> at the end when they, they left certain objections unanswered, right. you know. Uh, but I <laughs> well, and of course, you're not always going to have a Dr. Scott Hahn there, you know, as the MC of the thing. And so there can be you're entering into sort of, you know, it can be a little challenging. People Absolutely. go in there and a little scary. Even you say these things. Well, can I ever get out of this hole that I've yeah. now dug for myself? You know, yeah. um, and I think it's important when people either use this book or any other kind of resource like this um, to kind of not be afraid of that and also not to be afraid of at some point saying, you know what, I don't know the answer. I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. And have the humility to say that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's sort of disconcerting uh, that even among seminarians, you may find people completely clueless yeah. concerning uh, the, the teachings of, of the church. Has it always been like that, I wonder? I think we're, no. I mean, I, I, I think, I'm, I'm sure there have always been seminarians who have come from families and from parishes where they weren't particularly well formed in the faith. But I think it's certainly much more um, common and extreme today. Having said that, there are some seminarians who come in with ex, with, ex, with exceptional formation. Right. You know, but but the, the issue of gender oh, dysphoria, yeah. for example, I know yeah. that's a hot button issue, is. a flashpoint. But I, I suspect that there must be some seminarians who experience this. So how do you disabuse them? Right. It, it can't be just a matter of argument. Right. Um, well, I hope seminarians wouldn't be experiencing gender dysphoria, but <laughs> that would be a, <laughs> the, the challenge in the seminary. But certainly they would be experiencing um, the challenge of addressing that, no, you know, it's right. how, how, do I, family, how do I speak about yeah. that in their family, cousins, that's, brothers and sisters sometimes, right. and so. No, and, and maybe we could just go to that. Yeah, that, sure. that, that is, obviously, it's a hot topic. You said that you want to cr try to do something that is coming around the kitchen table. This is being discussed everywhere right. on yeah. every channel. So right. how does one deal with this? And I think that would be a good example because a lot of them, while they would say, and I'll ask them when they're coming into the seminar, so do you, you accept all the church's teachings? Are there any right. that you don't agree with or any that you struggle with? And the answer is almost almost invariably, well, I, I accept them all, but I don't understand them all. Right. You know, no. I can't defend them all because I don't really understand. So they say, I, I trust what the church says about gender dysphoria or something like that. And I think that would be a, you know, a, an example of, of where you'd start with, you say, well, you're going to start imagining what are, some of the, what are some of the reasons why gender dysphoria, why the church's teaching on gender dysphoria is wrong, you know, for yeah. example. Um, I'd say that you know gender is sort of easy. Imagine even just reading an article or reading an essay by somebody who experiences this, and they'd start out by saying, "Well, this is who I am, and who are you to tell me that this is not what I am? This right. is what I feel about myself." Yeah. Um, and you know, just because I don't have certain particular reproductive organs doesn't make me not what I am convinced I am, right? And, and who yeah. are you to say otherwise? So that would be a very clear and obvious sure. objection. And let me just say yeah. to that end is is that I, my experience in working with the young people, their students, is. They come in, they, they want to love the church, they want to believe what the church teaches, yeah. but they've been so inundated with this, there's almost, if you actually speak up, you're going to be canceled, you're going to be silenced. So there's a fear that goes into it. That. So I, I think that you do, do something really positive in allowing them to be honest. It says, okay, Definitely. I know that there's something wrong about this argument, but yeah. to this end, it's, it's they don't want to be a bully. They don't want to be prejudiced. They don't want to be a bigot. All of these things that, that the weight of what the world and culture is telling them, particularly right. with this issue. And something that Dr. Hahn said earlier, which is that part of the reason for studying apologetics is not just to overcome prejudices or to kind of to address questions, but also to grow in confidence ourselves, you Absolutely. know, and that lack of confidence may be what's underlying that lack of courage that can yeah. sometimes be that. I'm not sure I want to go out on a limb here because I'm not sure I completely buy this thing, you know. It seems like the church really is unfair and yeah. bigoted and transphobic in this case. Well, you know, years before uh, when, when 
uh, the then Pope Benedict spoke about the dictatorship of yeah. relativism. I think he nailed it. Right. I mean, that's in the air. It, it, it's, it's something you can't escape, and it infects even the most well-intentioned Catholic who, who has to somehow repose upon sheer fide, fideism. Well, you know, it's, it's not rational that I believe this, but the church tells me I have to believe it and I want to submit. But in fact, there has to be a reasonable basis yeah. for these claims that we make. So right. let, let's go, what is a reasonable basis of this for ungendered dysphoria? Well, I mean, I think the, the fundamental thing is that what we, we believe in an understanding of reality that is something objective out there that is truth. And, and, and truth is the conformity of our mind to that reality out there. It's not simply an internally generated thing, right? So that's kind of so no matter sort how of summarizing strongly that. I believe it. No matter how strongly you believe it, it may not be true. I may strongly right. believe that Lake Erie is actually the Atlantic Ocean. But okay, but who am I to tell Atlantic you Ocean. what's true or not? Who are, you know, how can I as a Catholic place on you what I believe to be true? Exactly. So I think the, the first step is actually acknowledging maybe this uh, different approach to reality that we have. So I think just acknowledging that. And there may be, by the way, in some of these discussions, there may be a point where we sort of have to agree to disagree, mm -hmm. where we say, well, it just, you, you have a view of reality which is fundamentally different than my view of reality, or than the Catholic view of reality, the, the, the classical view of reality, and that is a step gained, right? If, if we can just sort of say, well, then really our discussion is not about gender dysphoria anymore, it's about whether there is something true outside of myself, yeah. which is a fascinating yeah. and, right. and really yeah, important discussion. a great discussion. topic to have, absolutely. And it's a great topic to have, and maybe we need to have that, in, you know, rather than starting at letter F, we need to start at letter A, you right. know, and, and start it, Is there, there a there there? Yeah, is there, there anything there. out there? And if right. so, and by the way, everyone believes that there is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> whether they're able to kind of rationalize that or not, yeah. I mean, somebody who struggles, and I know that we're getting into some pretty controversial water here, but somebody who struggles with anorexia, yeah. you, it is called medical malpractice to not absolutely, tell them absolutely. that they in fact are not fat, right? And they say, because there's an objective, but they say, but I really feel like I'm fat. Right. You're not, yeah. you know, and, and I have to help you understand and come to a mature understanding and awareness of who you actually are. This is what we should be doing with people who struggle with gender dysphoria. That's a, an exquisite example you cite. Uh, somebody told me once that those who suffer from this, uh, are in the most intractable of, of predicaments. It's the most difficult thing of all to remedy. And yet, they're not fat, but they've convinced themselves they are. They're sunk in a kind of solipsism that I think maybe nothing short of a miracle can uh, dislodge. Yeah, and Father, maybe this is going to an area that, that is maybe not best, but with that topic as well, and honestly with the gender dysphoria as well, is that there is a deception. Ultimately, having dealt with lots of people over the years, there's a fundamental lie that they've bought into that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of manifested them, that's in, in that individual. Is that something you deal with? I mean, I, I think it's in some ways it's diabolical, yeah. right? Yeah. Do you, how, do, how do you deal with that? How do you try to... Well, okay, let me step back. And yeah. one thing I, I do when I'm forming the seminarians in this regard, and it is important, I think I mentioned in the introduction, and that is, this, this is not how you have the discussion with somebody. It's right. like, no, I'm going to give you your objections, so I'm going to respond to your yeah, objections, yeah, exactly. and then you're going to convert, and you're going to, you know, this, <laughs> right. or you're going to start, Yay, you know. it's all over. It's not. Yeah. This is to form our minds so that we can, using the gifts of the Holy Spirit, our own, our own ingenuity, our knowledge of the person, our love for the person, explain it in such a way that is, that is winning, that is, um, that is attractive to them, that is, that is accessible to them. And it might be that we take small baby steps, one at a time, but right. in our love for that person, in our care for that person, having the knowledge that we have, we can maybe edge them a little closer and closer and closer. Because the fact is that there will be a day, perhaps, where they look back and they say, who told me the truth? You know, right, when I was right, lying to myself, right, right. who was strong enough to tell me the truth? Yeah. You know, it's really helpful to get beyond that kind of sparring or boxing match, you know, and even rhetorical ping pong where you're just trying to yeah. get it past them. But you do instill that confidence, you know, and since we're talking about gender dysphoria, you know, the fact is we're not, re we're not reductionists. We're not just reducing people down to their organs, yeah. you know, to their physical yeah. bodies, as it yeah. were. Right. We're also not separating them from that. But you also deal with the uh, civil rights issue, the scientific issue of intersex and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. You also deal with binary gender thinking, which is more like critical theory applied, you know, and, and, I, and I realized when we talked about this, you know, like starting five minutes ago, uh, it would be another show, you know, to really do it justice. But you give us the raw material, you give us what we need to really enter into that conversation so that they realize you're not just reacting to me you are realizing that I've got good reasons for, and so even if you don't walk away winning, you know, yeah. 
you walk away winning the respect and the trust of the other person. You, you, you really equip Catholics to listen and to hear them. And I appreciate that greatly. Yeah, yeah, great. that you greatly listened. Yeah. 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 To that end, um, maybe just to tie a bow on, on this particular topic, okay, I can imagine people are like, so what, what's the answer? <laughs> so what's the answer? So yeah. Maybe just bring, I, I, sure. I think you were taking us there, that, that there are some things that are fundamentally true, that, that, that it, the individual doesn't determine, I'm not, I'm creating God's image and likeness, right. you know, male and female, and it's not up to me to decide, but maybe just a Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the way that the kind of the contemporary sort of view of the person is, is that sex and gender are radically, sort of there's a sharp delineation between the two. Sex is something that is biological, you know, and, and, and gender is something that is, that is really subjectively created and generated, yeah. which is why you can have this sort of infinite number of genders, you know. Right. Um, whereas the church's understanding is that we're much more of a, of a, of a whole being than that, right? That our, that our sex is clearly biological. Gender is something that you know, until 50 years ago, was synonymous with sex. Right. Um, I think that there is an advancement with this understanding. It's certainly not what kind of the, the gender dysphoria kind of, you know, uh, argument would be, which is that it's something radically subjective. But we do recognize that there are subjective elements to it, that it's not just masculinity and femininity clearly have sure. cultural sure. aspects to them, but there's also something that, that does uh, emerge from within, from, from kind of that biological, from our biological makeup. But and you're showing that they're not so, opposed. And they're not opposed it, to each they're other. They're interdependent. Right. And so Catholics distinguish to unite. Yeah. They don't distinguish to separate and then end up opposing. And that explanation, I think, also gives people a sense of at least pause, if not peace, like, okay, I can see, I can see that. Yeah. Even if they don't necessarily agree, it's just a reasonable way to understand sex and gender as distinct, but interdependent. And, and beautiful. mutually comp yeah, and, exactly. and it's a beautiful it's a gift of the human person. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. And we will be back with more Franciscan University Presents, so stay with us. Speak with charity. Always be ready to give an explanation to anyone who asks you for a reason for your hope. But do it with gentleness and reverence, keeping your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who defame your good conduct in Christ may themselves be put to shame. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. What if you discovered a university with unmatched science, faculty, and programs? a place where you didn't have to choose science over faith. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, you'll find faith-inspired, student-focused, research-driven programs leading to satisfying careers in medicine, scientific research, engineering, computer science, and many more science and health fields. At Franciscan University of Steubenville, education is more than just a word, it's a discovery. Welcome back and thanks for joining us. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, which we record here in the Comarts studio here at Franciscan University in Steubenville. Our students are operating all of the cameras and the equipment and our theology professors, Dr. Martin and Dr. Hahn and I are discussing how to talk about church teachings with our special guest, uh, Father Carter Griffin. Um, you, again, the, you provide so many different uh, topics that allow us to delve in this conversation, the discussions, the theology, the practicality, this, all these kinds of things. But again, there's the lived experience of sitting down with somebody and talking about it. And, and you, 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 you invite us to be able to do this with humility and to be able to do this gently. Mm -hmm. um, that's really hard sometimes. Mm -hmm. So maybe some advice on how an individual can actually do that. Yeah, great, thank you. And that's really ultimately the purpose of the, of the book is to get to the point where you can actually have those conversations. It's not just a kind of, you know, playing sort of ideological ping pong in our heads. Um, and I think the first thing is to ask ourselves the question, uh, a, a very basic question, which is, do I, do I care for this person, right? Do I love this person? At some level, I mean, even if they're, you know, I don't know them well or something, I mean, if all I'm trying to do is sort of use them as a punching bag or to kind of make myself feel better by winning this, this, this academic <laughs> argument with them, yeah. then clearly we need to close our mouth and, sh you know, sit down. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing is just, do I, you know, I do, do I love souls, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and, or am I just looking to win an argument? I think a second thing is, I gotta know my stuff, right? I, got, yeah. I have to have some formation myself um, I don't have to have it perfectly down, I don't have to have every answer, um, but I need to know what, what the church teaches and make sure that I'm not making things worse, you know, by, by confusing <laughs> yeah, others, yeah, yeah. by confusing myself, yeah. by getting myself trapped into a kind of a rabbit hole. Um, 
I think as well a certain humility in, um, in, 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 the, in the interaction, like not knowing where the conversation is going to go, not sort of bulldoze it or, you know, into a certain direction, but really allow the conversation to flow naturally. I mean, we have to start, you know, Pope Francis is always talking about accompaniment, and it's, that's the Catholic uh, idea. You know, you go to where the person is, and then you accompany them from there. You don't sort of stand over here and start spouting off arguments that, the, you know, that, that you think that they would have. Um, and I think also one last point is just in our own minds as we're kind of dealing with these different topics um, is to not give in to the error that hard is necessarily wrong. We're going to have to say hard things, and we're going to have to encourage people to do hard things. Absolutely. You know, telling a, a scared young woman who is struggling with, you know, an unwanted pregnancy, you know, that, 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 that abortion is not the right answer, that's asking her to do something very hard. And yeah. we, can't, we can't pretend it's not. You know, somebody who's struggling with gender dysphoria and to say that there's another way to look at this thing, and you don't have to buy all the lies that everything out there is telling you. Right. Even though it's, you know, there are 99% of what you hear, it doesn't make it right. What I'm saying is harder, but it doesn't mean that it's wrong. And, and I think that's important to that as well, is it's difficult and I'm willing to walk with you. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's one of the things is that I think that some individuals are anxious about walking because they don't want to be associated with mm. whatever their topic that you're dealing with. And we've got to be willing to get messy and, yeah. and, and wrestle with these issues. With yeah. You have to engage the other. It's not enough just to uh, give them the syllogism and then walk away and look for another uh, a victim. Right. Uh, you, you, I mean, Pope Francis, I think, is spot on. You do accompany them. The faith is not something you impose from without. You propose it from within. And it's our faith. And we're both we're both uh, judged by this faith. It overarches everything, uh, and it, it's not imperialism. I'm not arrogant when I propose it, and I don't presuppose it either. I mean, I can't take it for granted. So you have to be prepared to go back to bedrock. You know, the unexamined uh, uh, assumptions, the, the undisturbed premises, and they are tough. You know, the belief that God is both one and three, that's not easy. It's not a function of the higher math. It's a mystery, <laughs> and you're going to have to stay with it. It's not going to be easy. You know, there is another layer, though, uh, besides accompaniment and listening and being patient, and that is overcoming your fear of rejection. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that sad fact is something that you'll probably have to face if you're engaging people who deeply disagree with the church on a number of issues. You know, I remember hearing Arthur C. Brooks commenting, he was interviewed on his new book, Strength the Strength, you know, and he teaches at, uh, he's a devout Catholic, but he teaches at Harvard Business School, and he teaches the elite, I mean, the, the cream of the crop. And you know, he, he asked them what they're afraid of, and of course, they're impervious to their fears until they're not, you know. And then they all admit their fear of, they're afraid of failure because they've they're here at Harvard, you know, and they've never failed. And, and so he has the right essays about, you know, imagine, you know, rejection and failure. And now there's a game. I think it's something like a rejection therapy oh. where a, a guy who was just so afraid of rejection realized that in psychology and in counseling, you know, if somebody's afraid of snakes and it's an irrational fear, just expose them to a, lots of pictures of snakes or airplanes or whatever. And, and I think there is a sense in which we've got to get over ourselves and over this fear of being rejection, rejected. It doesn't mean that we therefore come on, you know, in an offensive way. But I, I do think that there is an understandable fear mm -hmm. that the person is simply going to reject the church's teaching and us as well. Yeah, I think part of that fear also, Scott, is a, a fear of being judgmental. I mean, the the the, right. the great crime yeah, in, right. in the, the young people today sense. is you can't be judgmental. Yeah. So if you express an opinion or if you express a teaching of the church, you're so judgmental, and that is just weighs upon them. But I think yeah. you, you you do that beautifully in allowing us to be able to present the truth in charity and in kindness and compassion. Well, it's sort of, um, frankly, it's easy when you sort of have this kind of, you know, very morally neutral way of, of, of but I mean, the fact is in a real, in a real conversation, it's a little bit messier than that, as yeah. you were saying earlier. I mean, you know, Arthur Brooks, you know, his outrage industrial complex, right? yes. I mean, it's, there is, there is a tremendous amount of just generated rage out there, and we are entering into that, and, yeah. you know, people are, are going to be filled with that, and it might come out on us. I was know? actually, and I was thinking about Brooks when I was reading your book, because he, he's got a thing they did called The Art of Disagreement. Oh, yeah. And, and yes. you can't, you can't right. disagree anymore. You, you, you can't. We've lost the ability yeah, to disagree to well, disagree. Right, which right, is right. a great Civil way discourse. to put it. But yeah. well, if, if you're going to yeah. give somebody a reason for the hope that you have, you can't be a snowflake. 
uh, I mean, you, you don't want to be, uh, uh, it's not bravado, uh, but there is a, a courage that is required. And I think the best example of that would be somebody like uh, Justin Martyr, mm -hmm. who is the father of Catholic apologetics. He perfected the art and the science of defending the faith. And the fact that his last name is Martyr suggests <laughs> that he was certainly rejected uh, in, in a pretty yeah. obvious way. I mean, he tried to appeal to the emperor, Marcus Aurelius, who was hearing none of it and had the guy's head cut off, but he didn't give up. I mean, the arguments he made were sound as a bell, and he didn't let his fears get in the way of, uh, of making them. Which is why the gift of prudence is so necessary in this, yeah, right? Because right. you have these two things. You have obviously the courage, and, you know, which is not bravado, but then you have the silence, which is, which is cowardice, you know, and right, figuring right. out. And maybe speak out. to that, because isn't, yeah. wouldn't it discernment? say that sometimes you do need to be silent. Absolutely, I mean, that's yeah. never, mm -hmm. I mean, that could be an option. Maybe speak to that. that. I think there's a sense that every opportunity I have, I've got to put it out there. And I don't <laughs> no. think that, no. you said something I think really beautiful earlier. You said, sometimes we can actually do more harm. Yeah. That, so speak to that. Well, and I think there's there's silence, which is just silence. And then there's silence, which is endorsement, Dis right? And okay, I think right, that, you right. know, and, and there's silence, which is disagreement. But I mean, I think the silence we want to avoid is something that would be misconstrued. So. I mean, to take a common yeah, example, yeah. people telling sort of racy jokes or something like that, or inappropriate, saying inappropriate things about, you know, well, I mean, there's a silence which is clearly like sort of, you know, I'm sort of enjoying the joke too, maybe you smile every now and again. And then there's a silence which is, you know, this is not the conversation for me, and, and you can, you know, walk up, you know, and get a glass of water or something like right. that. I don't want to be a part. Well, there's, a, there's silence in both cases, but you're doing it differently. And I think the same thing is true when somebody has, you know, a, a, a view which is different than the church's, and they make it clear and they make it public, there's a way of, of um, of, se of stepping back from that for a moment, you know, and it might be necessary to kind of, first of all, collect your own thoughts, see is this really the right time, the right circumstance. Yeah, yeah. and if you go in there barreling with go both guns, both barrels going, you know, you could make things worse for you that. You know, One of the questions Catholic, Catholic kids in public high schools, yeah. Yeah. Catholic kids in state universities, right. or even some Catholic universities, I mean, they really have to cultivate that virtue of prudence yes. to exercise sound judgment so they're not just rushing into every battle. Yeah. And the question I ask myself sometimes, am, am I the right person for this? Like I've been oh, in situations right. before that I said, okay, this needs to be dealt with, but because of relationship or because of circumstances, it may not be me. But I try to identify the person that, and, and right. try to connect those two that allows and You need self-knowledge. I mean, yeah. sometimes that's, yeah. that's just a, a veil for, for cowardice. Yeah. Other times it's not, you know, yeah. and yeah. really being honest with ourselves. I, I really may not be the right person, but at the same time, I may go and pray about it and, and consult exactly, with somebody, exactly. maybe learn a little bit about yeah. something, and then say, like, you know what, I need to make that phone yeah. call. Yeah. 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 You know, you know uh, Hans Urs von Balthasar says that it's not a matter of learning or cleverness, but but a matter of putting yourself at risk, having the courage to put yourself out there. And, and there's, there's a wonderful example of that. Joseph Ratzinger sent him one of his books after the council. And, and Balthazar wrote back on a postcard and said, thank you, Joseph, but in the future, don't presuppose the faith, propose it in ever more compelling and vibrant ways. Don't be afraid to go back to bedrock to cite Trinity, Christ, church, Eucharist, the whole nine yards. That's what the world needs mm -hmm. to hear. I think it sometimes takes courage to confront someone who, for example, believes that same-sex marriage is perfectly valid and, and calls himself a Catholic or thinks it's all right to kill unborn babies, but he's a, he's, he's a, he's a Catholic politician, and say, look, what you're doing is putting your soul uh, at, at risk, at peril. And in addition, you're killing a lot of children. Stop it. Right. And one of the one of the distinctions you just made there is like what the pers what the person's position is. All right. We're going to deal differently when with with a cousin of ours, with a peer, with somebody you know in grade school or high school or something like that, than with somebody who has responsibility um, to, right, to right. propose and teach the faith, either in, as a as a clergyman or as a right. in politician or a teacher or something like that. Clearly, our 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 rationale is going to be different. Our 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 judgment is going to be different. You said something earlier, Father, and you alluded to Regis that. I thought was beautiful. You said the love of their soul, you know, and I oh, think yeah. that, that there are individuals who want to win an argument more than they actually have the love of that person. How, do you, how does somebody grow in that? How do you, yeah. how do you grow in inability to You know, love? I love the term supernatural outlook, you know, like am I, am I seeing this situation, am I seeing this interaction in a supernatural, as a believer? Because the fact is we can so often, you know, our fight or flight, you know, thing can get up there and we sort of start making judgments on purely human considerations. 
Whereas if we sort of have a more supernatural outlook, I think we'll be less afraid of rejection. I think we'll be more courageous with the person we yeah. need to be. But at the same time, we can also step back and be much more gentle than we would otherwise naturally want to be. Right. right? So like really, pr I think praying to the guardian angels, pray, you know, that person's and yours, you know, yeah, yeah. You, know, uh, you know, asking, you know, praying to the Holy Spirit, asking for that gift of prudence. Um, and, and again, sometimes it takes stepping away, even just for a couple of minutes, really praying for that gift, you know, and say like, what is my next step here? And I think that that goes a long way to sort of sort of figuring out these these very tricky situations. And you know, the fact is, sometimes we need to kind of keep our powder dry, you know, and, yeah, and, and right. come back later yeah, on yeah, and yeah, yeah. Say, let's get coffee sometime, yeah, you know. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. there, there's a, a an example that just popped into my mind of, of what you're describing. Fulton Sheen yeah. had a great friendship with Claire Booth Luce, who was not yet a Catholic, and he's trying to edge her in the direction of the faith. And and he suggested, well, why don't we meet at St. Patrick's Cathedral? We'll walk around and we can chat. And as they come close to the confessional, he edges her ever so slightly in the direction of the box. Right. Uh, and suddenly she's there. And so he hears her confession. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean that's, that's not a frontal assault, it, it's, but it is sort of a kind of entrapment mm -hmm. and insidiousness. Right. But he loves her. When you love someone, you want to give them the very best you have. And yeah. that's the faith. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a human response, too. I mean, let's get coffee. You know, uh, in the last two days, I, I've had coffee with a, a former atheist who's now a, a, an evangelical, and they've still got a long way to go. You know, another one with an ex-Catholic who is making their way back and just listening over coffee and finding out how much you share in common, how many people you know, you know, uh, together, um, just forging the bonds of friendship. You know. We had Mike Aquilina as a guest a while back, Friendship and the Fathers, mm -hmm. how the early church evangelized. Well, that's also how the early church did apologetics. Yeah, I mean, yeah. not for Justin Martyr. There's a public <laughs> yeah, intellectual yeah, yeah. there yeah. who's going to face that prospect of martyrdom. Yeah. But most of the everyday type of evangelizing and of apologetics is friendship. I was thinking the same thing when you said, you know, take her to the box, to the confessional. <laughs> uh, my thought was exactly that. It's like there's more people that I've met in the coffee shop first. Like yeah. right. when I was working on some doctoral work, I, was, I would go to Panera Bread mm -hmm. and, and more Bible studies and beautiful conversations are taking place right. in the coffee yeah. shop. Yeah. That's right. That's great. Well, well, Scott, yeah. I can't think of all of the coffee you've consumed without <laughs> thinking at the same time of all of the converts you have won. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing you pointed out is so true, which is like, let's start with finding some common ground. Yeah. There are very few people out there we have nothing in common with. You know, and I don't just mean like other interests. I mean, even right. about these sub substantive issues. I mean, somebody who is, you know, who, who, who believes that, you know, the church is wrong on abortion, uh, we agree that the, that the woman should be respected, you right. know, that this is, this is not just pro-child, this is also pro-woman, you know, yeah. and we have that in common. So let's talk about that's that and explore yeah. that. Yeah, start there. Good. Yeah. Well, next our panel and our guests will share their concluding thoughts on how we talk about church teachings. Please stay with us. False beliefs. There are not over a hundred people in the United States who hate the Catholic Church. There are millions, however, who hate what they wrongly believe to be the Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, if we Catholics believed all of the untruths and lies which were said against the Church, we probably would hate the Church a thousand times more than they do. Venerable Fulton J. Sheen, Preface to Radio Replies. Why study apologetics? In baptism, every Catholic receives a personal apostolic commission from the Lord to help others embrace the truth. As adults, the more convinced we are by the truth, beauty, and goodness of the gospel, the full gospel proclaimed in the Catholic Church, the more earnestly we desire others to receive it. Father Carter Griffin. There is a place where education begins and faith and reason connect. Franciscan University of Steubenville's online programs will advance your career through an e-learning experience that's both academically excellent and passionately Catholic. With online degrees taught by full-time professors in theology, catechetics, business, education, and other disciplines, you can earn your master's degree online without changing your lifestyle. Find out more today at franciscan.edu, where your faith and career can connect online.
welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've come to our last segment, so Dr. Martin, if you'd like to share yeah, your thoughts. This is really a great book. I'm so glad you've, you've written it. I'm waiting for the sequel. Okay. <laughs> the next uh, 25. Yeah, a, a couple of uh, vignettes uh, come to mind. Uh, one is from St. Paul. This is the more famous of, of, of the two. We all know what happened to him. He went to Athens uh, and he preached uh, about uh, the unknown God who became man, uh, the Jew who died as a felon and yet rose three days later, at which point the sophisticated scoffers of Greek rationalist uh, culture laugh him right off the stage. Um, it, they, they, they dismiss him derisively. So sometimes you don't succeed. And yet, as long as he kept on the topic of generality, uh, they were impressed, you know, because they had this sense of the sacred. The, the ancient world was suffused with, with a sense of, of, of the sacred. And, and, the, and nature itself revealed the luminous depths of, of the divine. So he's talking to people who resonate with what he's saying. It's only when he gets scandalously particular and talks about the specific uh, instance of Christ, the crucified Jew who, who rose from the grave, that they run screaming from the Areopagus. We don't want to hear anything more from you, Paul. So sometimes it doesn't work. Other times, uh, if it does work, uh, it's, it's sort of, uh, I don't know, short-changed uh, or, or diminished. And, and that brings to mind the other example, John Henry Newman. When he wrote uh, the essay on, on, on the development of doctrine, I mean, that's a masterpiece in fundamental theology. It, it seems that one of his fans who really admired him just didn't have time to read it. And, and he said, uh, do you mind just giving me a precy? Give me a quick summary of, of what you, you said. And Newman's reply, I, I thought, was a masterpiece. He said, Catholicism is not something that you can put into a teacup. Mm -hmm. It is rich and deep and profound. You're going to need more time with it. Mm -hmm. So maybe you should read the book uh, and make the time for that. So I think people reading this book, which is kind of a teacup, uh, they're going to be enticed, I hope, to read more, to dig uh, and plunge deeper uh, into this well, which is infinitely rich and infinitely limpid. So they're going to go back to Thomas, that's and great. you will have been the way station. <laughs> that's yeah. great. That's great. Thank you, Richard. Just touch on yeah, A little tag team here, because I, I think back to what we were talking about in the beginning. And to go full circle, you know, by beginning with the opponent's arguments, uh, and by treating, treating them respectfully and fairly and precisely, uh, it's just so effective. It's so right-headed. I remember back, you know, in the early 90s when we had that debate at our house, you know, for a couple of years on Sunday nights. When we got to Sola Scriptura, the Creator Catholics were just incapable of taking it seriously. Um, and even the converts, and sola fide as well. So I was frustrated, so I was teaching an apologetics class at the time with almost all of them enrolled. And so I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna present the Protestant position for sola scriptura. And I worked on it, and I presented it. I remember at the end of the class, looking around, and just, it was as though a depression had come over all of them. Yeah. And I'm like, what's wrong? And like, how will you ever dig yourself out of those arguments, you know? Well, it took me a week and a half, but they were like liberated by that. And I did the same thing with sola fide, you know, faith alone, oh, come on, you know? But when you take it seriously, you realize there are good arguments, there are better rejoinders, you know? But again, this, this desire for snappy answers to what you really right. deep down believe are stupid questions. You gotta overcome that, but you've also gotta help people gain uh, a capacity and a confidence in giving effective answers. But I think even more so, this book shows you the need for the critical sympathy that means digging deeper to find the roots of the way people are thinking in order to not only respond to them, but to really understand why they think that way so that you can communicate respect and feel the force of those arguments and let them see that you are feeling the force of the counter arguments that you're responding to just out of nothing other than human respect. Mm -hmm. And this, I, I just hope and pray that this is going to set into motion a sort of new genre in apologetics yeah. where everyone will say, the Catholics will take you seriously. Mm. That's great, good. Father Carter. Um, thank you, you know, and I think those are really helpful for me just to, as I'm processing through. And one thought that I would have is, uh, you know, 
apologetics is sometimes dismissed as something that's kind of light. You know, it's not really theological. It's not even really catechetical. What's the point? Um, but I would say that that apologetics is really part of the spiritual work of mercy. You know, that that you are instructing the ignorant. That you, this, it is an apostolic work. Um, and when you are helping people overcome their prejudices, come to a deeper awareness of the faith, um, it's it's not just a kind of a purely intellectual or rationalistic thing. Um, that it's an evangelical thing. Yeah. And it was certainly a big part of my own conversion. I think it was a big part of your conversion. It was a big part of many people's conversions. And, and even ca cradle Catholics need to have that conversion later on. I think the second thing I would just say is, you know, that the, the most important um, apologetic uh, is, is our, own, our own witness, you know, our own holiness, our joy, um, our authentic desire for, 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 for sanctity. Um, th when we do that, then there is a kind of a power to the words that come out in an apostolic or an evangelical or a, an, uh, uh, an, an apologetical discussion. Um, and also to recognize, you know, not being afraid of rejection, um, that, you know, and being convicted ourselves that the good news is always good, you know, and that, that we have some hard things that we're going to need to say, uh, and, and some people are, are not going to accept it, uh, at least not at first go. Very few people are intellectually honest enough to sort of in the middle of a conversation be like, you know what, I was wrong, I'm you're sorry. right, I ch just changed my position. <laughs> right, you know? right. But a lot of us, you know, and maybe, you know, but a lot of us later on will think, maybe like, you know what, that was not a bad point. I need to look yeah. in that a little bit more. So hopefully this book will be a, a kind of a, a springboard for some of those discussions. Yeah, that's great. Uh, if you would like to learn more about today's topic, we have this handout for you, the introduction to Father Car Carter's book, Cross-Examined, Catholic Responses to the World's Questions. This hand handout is available to you for free simply by going to faithandreason.com or calling the number that you're going to see on the screen uh, momentarily. Uh, Father, I, again, I appreciated your, your presentation in the book. One of the things that I was struck by was the need that we have to be able to engage, that, that Jesus comes in the incarnation and he engages a world that desperately needs him, needs a savior. And it's the same thing with us, is that we are all surrounded when we meet them on the soccer fields and we meet them in the coffee shops and we meet them in the cubicles of the places that we work. And somebody needs to be able to engage them. And my concern is oftentimes we, we separate ourselves from those people because they don't believe what we believe and we don't want to be in fact, I don't know, all kinds of reasons. But what you do is I think you provide an individual a confidence, we've spoken to that a couple of times, a confidence, uh, a source, a place that they can go to that allows them to begin that process of engagement. Um, and you do it with a humility. And, and part of that could be that you're a convert, right? Is that you maybe held some things in the past and you, and you, you, you work through that being changed and being that converted. And I think that's a great blessing that each one of us, as you alluded to, each one of us needs to be able to do that. So you provide an individual uh, a resource that I think will be a able to help them engage another person and then hopefully bring them to the truth and the goodness of the gospel. Like you said, it is good news. We need to be able to stand on well, that. Thank you, so perhaps you could offer us a closing prayer and your blessing. I'd be happy to. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious Father, we thank you for the gift of the beauty of the faith that you have placed in our hearts. We ask you to strengthen and to enlarge that faith, and especially to enlarge that faith so that we may desire uh, the instruction and the salvation of all the souls around us. Fill us with confidence and with courage, and bless those whom we speak to, anoint our conversations, and let them redound to your glory, to their salvation, and to our own joy forever in heaven. And the Lord be with you. And with your and spirit. With your Almighty spirit. God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Download a free handout on today's topic at faithandreason.com, where you can also watch past episodes of Franciscan University Presents. Or request the handout by emailing us at presents at franciscan.edu or reach us by phone for today's handout by calling 800-783-6447 that's 800-783-6447